Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be invited to this prestigious conference. And uh, I have already changed a little the title. Uh, it's now Strategy to Manage Emerging Micropollutants in Waters. Uh, I'm not a groundwater specialist, but I'm quite involved during the last years in the problem of micropollutants. What are emerging micropollutants? I think that's quite clear. Anthropogenic chemical compounds detected in drinking water, in raw water, in surface water, and in wastewater. Uh, for example, the pesticides. I still remember 15 years ago, there was a standard of 0.5 micrograms per liter, even if it was not measurable at that time for many of them. Uh, today we have, again, emerging micropollutants, new pharmaceuticals, new industrial chemicals, sweeteners, heavy metals, new agrochemicals. I've heard that we have actually about 50 million registered chemicals from UPAC, and it's about actually about 10 million per year in addition. And maybe actually we use about 100,000 of them or have been used in the past. And only to have an impression what the threat is, with one mole of a chemical, we can supply every liter of water on the globe, including the oceans, with about 400 molecules. We have about 10 to the 21 liters of water, and we have 10 to the 23 uh, mo molecules per mole. Now, what is the link between wastewater, surface water, and drinking water? We have point sources mainly the wastewater, where the pollutants, again, are diffuse sources because in an urban area, uh, chemicals come from everywhere. We have diffuse sources mainly in agriculture and with air pollution. And the sources of drinking water are surface waters, where we have the direct influence of wastewater and air pollution, from River Danube, we can calculate how many people are connected to River Danube by uh, calculating the daily load of carbamazepine, for example, uh, which is a non-degradable compound. We can use bank filtrate where we have a direct influence of the surface waters, and we can have pristine groundwater where still the drinking water supply is dream of, where we have mainly air pollution and to some extent, of course, also geology, which pollutes the water. Uh, if we look at the basics, the first and the second law of thermodynamics, we can say all anthropogenic compounds which are used or have been used in the past or come to the market will be distributed all over the globe by air and water. And the second law tells us that you cannot destroy by 100% any of these compounds. Something will always be left because it's, uh, you need too much energy yes, to destroy every molecule. So everything is everywhere. And we can find uh, fluorated uh, poly FTP, yes, tensides, even in, the green, in Greenland, in the ice pairs, and you can find lead already at the Roman period of time, in the ice of the Antarctic. If we, we have a constant progress in analytical sensitivity, which results in an increasing number of detected pollutants in all waters, and so in principle, the problem with the chemicals will increase in the future if we continue to define clean water by the absence of anthropogenic chemical compounds, which would be a natural water, yes? But with five, with seven billion inhabitants now, and maybe nine to 10 billion in 40, 50 years' time, an increasing living standard of human activity, we will detect the chemicals everywhere. Therefore, we have to base our strategies on, a, on an acceptable risk, which is related to the effects and not to the absence of chemicals. 
What are the basic questions, of course? What can we do? What can we, what can we do and hope? No. What can we hope and what should we do? What can we hope? We still hope that Paracelsus was okay in saying dosis facit venenum. Uh, so, and we hope that the natural development of higher organisms and ecosystems was protected by micropollutants and by their degradation capacity. So there were always toxic material in the environment and the microorganisms kept the concentrations so low that the higher organisms could develop. There are, of course, concerns. Does this idea also apply to man-made chemical compounds? Is the rate of innovation much higher than the rate of adaptation? Is the self-organization capacity rapid enough to cope with our constant innovation of chemicals? And we have a lack of scientific knowledge. These are the concerns. So what we know is that, of course, anthropogenic activity and natural processes result in risks. So no zero risk for drinking water consumption and for water protection. Production and use of chemicals, pharmaceuticals, synthetic material, and so on, are the driving forces for economic development, but also associated with risks which have to be managed. The complete absence of chemical compounds in waters and in drinking water can only be achieved for chemicals which have never been produced and are globally banned from production. So there is a scientific consensus, I think, that risk or hazards caused by chemicals is bound to their concentration or dose and their effect, which is the background of the EU REACH uh, uh, legislation. Yes. So we can, the chemical compounds themselves can be classified as dangerous or hazardous if there is a clear criterion for these. And without criterion, every compound can become dangerous, especially water. Yeah? You can be suffocated in water. Uh, the decomposition processes in natural systems are associated with the product of unknown intermediate chemical compounds. So if we have only one compound, this will result in many compounds in the environment if they are degraded. And that this is bound to the presence of a great variety of trace nutrients, sunlight and climate, so otherwise they could not be degraded. We have actually well-established scientific methods to determine threshold values for concentrations in drinking water, and similar methods are under development for aquatic ecosystems. And nevertheless, there is a need for a political, legal, and science-based strategy to cope with this problem. And this is the background that on the one side we have a change in our consciousness, which is, has to be put by politicians and uh, other stakeholders to a legal system so that we can decide whether our behavior is right or wrong. While science can only decide whether a theory is correct or false based on experimental background. Now, technology is closely bound to the legal system because we cannot ask the engineers to do things which they do not are not be able to do. And on the other side, the researchers are free in looking for the problems they want to tackle. So this is also a driving force in changing our consciousness. If we look at the risks, we are quite aware of the right side of this graph, which shows that beyond a certain, let's say, concentration of a compound, we will have damages, for example, prevention of high flood situations, where we, the costs created by the damages are higher than costs for the prevention of these problems. On the left side 
it is much more difficult. If we want to have zero concentration somewhere, we will have to add more and more energy, more and more water, uh, money. So we have to decide where the costs and the reduction of the risk are some in competition always. We have a, probably a broad range of acceptable risks and they are associated a little bit with a living risk in a society. For a developing country, the risk with drinking water might we can allow a higher risk probably than in very developed countries. This is a very interesting discussion I had with a Mexican colleague. So on the zero concentration is not sustainable, yes? Because we cannot achieve it due to the second law of thermodynamics. Now we have two types of risk from pollutants, micropollutants. The one where we know that there is a concentration below this concentration, we cannot detect the effect. Is a threshold value, and for these compounds, we can make a decision on the standard which says below this concentration, at least we don't know a risk. There is still the problem that the combination of many of these micropollutants may increase a risk. But there are also compounds where we have a continuous, where one molecule can cause a cancer. There we have to define an acceptable risk because drinking water, for example, is of course not the only risk we have, except much higher risk if we go on the streets, yes, for example. Now I want to talk a little bit about the strategy we have developed in North Rhine Westphalia to cope with emerging micropollutants and uh, it was mainly based on sudden strong increase of the concentration in drinking water of, of polyfluoride tensides and tosa, which is a uh, other industrial chemical. And this was very difficult for the politicians how to react to the public if suddenly you have 300 uh, nanograms of uh, polyfluoride tensides without having any standard, yes, for this compound. So there was a big political program which is called Rhein Ruhr, so Clean Ruhr River, is a very interesting uh, topic because the Ruhr River is the drinking water supply for about 5 million people and the receiving water of about 2.5 million people, wastewater. There's a very close relationship between industry, population, discharging the waste to the river and the drinking water abstraction for double the amount of people. Uh, the overall system, I won't go into detail, is of course uh, to have a policy uh, starting at the analysis of the actual situation and finally with information and consulting of the stakeholders. But I want to concentrate on the uh, implementation on the one side of the WHO water safety plans for the whole catchment based, which is based on an acceptable risk, not only on the pathogen side, but also on the chemical side, and linking drinking water quality and water protection, the whole catchment of the raw water source. But it was a strategic decision in Northern Australia to apply the same parameters and the same standards for quality assessment of drinking water and of the raw water source, which in this case is the river. So the basic goal is to have already, to meet already all drinking water standards in the river. Only the probability of compliance will be quite different because very short periods of low flow, for example, do not influence the long life uh, acceptable risk to drink this water and there's still the drinking water treatment which removes part of these compounds. So the standards are based basically on a 
guide value which was developed by the uh, German Environmental Agency. And what I think is very interesting, so the toxicologists in, in the German Environmental Protection Agency uh, were able to define threshold values for action, for political action. And they dare to say that if you measure in your drinking water or in the raw water a concentration of a, any compound beyond 50 microgram per, or below 50 microgram per liter, you have no immediate acute toxicity. So no immediate action is required. Of course, you have to start immediately information and remedial action plans for drinking water supply, consumer information, and to start a risk assessment and action for pollution abatement. If you are somewhere between 0.1 microgram per liter and 50 microgram per liter, no immediate action on drinking water supply. So if you are beyond 50, you have to immediately act. Yes, you have to stop uh, to stop drinking water supply because there's the, if you have no information of the, about this compound, you have to act. If you are below, down to 0.1 microgram per liter, uh, you need no immediate action, but you have, of course, to immediately start uh, risk assessment for standard value development and action for pollution reduction. There are only very rare compounds which are strong, gene toxic, and for them there is no immediate action required if you are below 0.01 microgram per liter. This is 10, uh, not milligram, but microgram per liter, yes. So it's 10 nanogram per liter. No action is required. This is the then developed action scheme. So if the chemical engineers detect a new compound, there is the sheet how they have to react and how the whole, I won't go into detail because this can be read in, in uh, and they have also defined quite a lot of different uh, concentrations for different kinds of toxic material where there no action is required and finally that so-called light wert, uh, somewhere depending on the effect on humans, they have different threshold values. And only if you have made the whole investigation where you are sure that the long life consumption of this water has, does not exert an unacceptable risk, then this will be a standard, a new standard for a new compound. For risk assessment and standard value development, they use this guide value, and the, I think the, the methods are quite uh, aware in the scientific area. For all organic micropollutants with, a, with such a uh, guide value below or higher than 10 microgram per liter, for example, the EDTA has a from the toxicology, you could allow 200 micrograms, uh, 200 micrograms per liter, yes, but they have decided the political decision but for a precautionary principle, they would not like to exceed the 10 micrograms per liter of any compound in the rivers. They have, of course, established a new monitoring system and they are on the way to adapt the administrative structure. We have this combined approach, of course, in Germany, and they also apply this as low as reasonable, achievable principle at specific point sources, for example, at wastewater treatment plants. And it's now the big question, what in Germany they would like to do at the point source of the treatment plant and what they will established technology at the water treatment plants, where it's a slower cost and higher effect for the, to minimize the risks. 
What we realized during this work is that many, for many micropollutants, the standards for aquatic ecosystems are lower than for human consumption. So this favors, of course, to have measured at the end of the treatment plants. So we have this combined approach, and I won't go into these details. This is, I think, well known. And now to some micropollutant abatement strategies. Of course, the best way would be to go to the sources by stopping use and production of these chemicals. For example, the EU priority substances, which where is the goal? Not to produce them anymore. And to, by the way, they will decrease and disappear, never completely, of course. The second way is to a post-treatment of wastewater with ozone or activated carbon. Uh, Switzerland has the first regulation for larger treatment plants. They will have to add a quaternary step with either ozone or activated carbon or both together. In Germany, there's a huge, a huge uh, research project underway. The next way would to stop application of substitution of potentially hazardous agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, animal pharmaceuticals, and so on. And of course, we can improve drinking water treatment technology, for example, by adding activated carbon filtration. What should be the criteria for source control? I think the first criteria is that chemical industry and pharmaceutical industry, and they are on the way that they have realized that not anymore the production is the problem, but the products, which is again a new situation for chemical and pharmaceutical industry. The standards for concentration of all compounds in all waters, I think this has no future. Especially because we have always the question, if we have thousands of chemicals in our water, what is the synergistic effect? So we have to go for test procedures for all chemicals, products, in regard to the human and ecotoxic effect before use. And the EU REACH regulation is such an approach. And these requirements could also be applied to all wastewater treatment plant effluents after adaptation to the wastewater matrix. So if a discharge of wastewater has to meet the requirements of EU REACH, Regulation, we should be sure that there will be no bad effects on ecology and also on humans. Uh, whether that's true has to be true. I think we have to prove it by making a test, full scale test. Now, at the end, I want to show you only some uh, results of a recent research, large research project in Vienna for micropollutant removal by ozone and powdered activated carbon treatment of treatment plant effluents. There's a lot of research going on, actually. The actual state of knowledge is that full nitrification at the treatment plants can be used as an indicator for efficient removal of many micropollutants. At the only BOD removal plant, this is very low, this removal efficiency. Ozone and powdered activated carbon post-treatment removes or destroys most of the remaining micropollutants, which we measure, measure, of course. All tests for REACH applied to the effluent after ozonation show that there's no toxic effect in this water anymore. The additional cost for this Post-treatment is in the range of 5 to 20 percent of actual nitrogen and phosphorus removal wastewater fees. Some test results from Vienna with an ozone addition of 5 milligram per liter without any post-treatment after the ozonation. And there are pilot investigations. This is a view of the main treatment plant of Vienna, 4 million population equivalents, a two-step treatment plant with full nitrification, 85% nitrogen removal, 90% phosphorus removal, 
and we have used ozonation to the effluent in a pilot plant for about 10,000 population equivalents. So it's quite a huge uh, pilot plant. The results for natural hormone below detection limit in the effluent already before the ozone treatment. A great number of micropollutants are reduced by ozone application below detection limit, and many pharmaceuticals are strongly redu reduced by ozonation. Ozone effect on the complexing agents depends on ozone doses. So this is a slide which shows the black columns is what a high rate only BOD removal plant achieves. The gray bars are for a nitrification, denitrification treatment system, and the white bars is the effect of ozonation. So we see that most of the chemicals are reduced either to detection limit or even beyond, at least beyond 90%. Ozone, of course, has also a disinfection effect. So the E. coli and enterococci can be reduced by ozone below the bathing water directive requirements for very good bathing waters. We have an excellent reduction of viruses but aerobic spores of bacteria are not affected by ozone. Ecotoxicology was tested with conventional biotests, green algae tests, inhibition tests, and so on. And all samples investigated did not show any toxicity effects on green algae, daphne, and fish eggs. But this is already true for the effluent samples without ozone treatment, so excellent biological treatment. Long-term fish tests showed that there's no difference between the fish in wastewater and in reference conditions. There's no visible effect as compared to reference conditions in regard to the sexual uh, parts of the fish and endocrinology, no detectable effect in ozone-treated effluents. For all the endocrinic substances, we could see a reduction of the estrogenic effect by a factor of 60 to 100. So really, we have no, no endocrinic effect anymore left in the effluent. The removal efficiency is lower for the uh, male hormones, yes? So we can readjust the, the difference between female and male, in, at least in the rivers. Uh, mutagenicity uh, tests with bacteria, plants, and animal cells showed no toxic, no, no, there is no indication that by ozonation we create toxic byproducts, which was one of the great uh, concerns by using ozone, especially from the drinking water people that don't like ozone in the wastewater. So, as a whole, we can say ozone application does not negatively affect mutagenicity of wastewater. Conclusions. In the coming decades, we will have a growing problem with chemical pollution at every scale, on the local scale as well as on the global scale. We find many of our chemicals we use already in the Antarctic or in the oceans and so on. So single compound strategies alone will not be sufficient. We will analyze uh, and spend all our money for anal analysis and have no decisions. So we need effect-detecting methods, uh, and they will have to be further developed. Strategies for short-term risk management, as in rural valley with the polyfluoride tensite, uh, will remain relevant especially where we have industries upstream, yes, and take drinking water from a bank filtrate, we have to have strategies to cope with emerging micropollutants. So the long-term risk management for humans and aquatic biology has to be further elaborated. And I think that we will have to apply all methods of prevention and control on the point sources as well as on the diffuse sources, and they will have to develop further and to be coordinated. 
Thank you very much for your attention.